hit record. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our program. We have um, an alumni career chat uh, for the next hour. We're going to be speaking with Raleigh McCoy from the MTC. I am Denora Meyer. I am an assistant director at the Career Center, and I work specifically with students at the College of Environmental Design, providing counseling and programming. And my tech backup person is Heidi Yu, and she is an LNS counselor and assistant director at the Career Center. And um, I really appreciate your being here, Heidi. Thank you very much. And then, of course, we have our alum, Raleigh McCoy. Um, and the way tonight's going to go, I'm going to ask Raleigh a couple of questions just to get the conversation going and then um, give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions you might have. I have some questions in my back pocket so that if you run out, I will be able to fill in the spaces. And hopefully by the time we're done here, you'll have a good sense of Raleigh's experience in the field, her path, and you'll have other questions answered that you are interested in learning about. So um, thank you so much, Raleigh, for coming and sharing, uh, agreeing to share your knowledge and experience. So the first question I have is please share just your title, your organization, um, and your role and responsibilities, giving students a general sense of what you do right now. Sure, and thank you for having me. So I am an Associate Transportation Planner at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Association of Bay Area Governments. MTC and ABAG are the joint agencies tasked with regional planning for transportation, housing, resilience, and other planning issues for the nine county Bay Area. So we plan for San Francisco, the East Bay, San Jose and the South Bay, Silicon Valley, as well as the North Bay. Uh, around 8 million people in total live in the region. And specifically, I'm a member of the regional planning program and I work primarily on Plan Bay Area 2050, which is a regional long range transportation plan, uh, looking out over the next three, three decades for the Bay Area and, and laying out a vision for transportation policy, but as, uh, in addition to that, also looking at policy for housing, environmental resilience and economic development. Um, in the past, I've also project managed as part of my involvement with MTC and ABAG uh, Vital Signs, which is a public facing open data portal. I'm really interested and passionate in making data more accessible. Um, and I also project managed in 2019 an online public engagement tool, which applied gamification tactics to try to get information from Bay Area residents on their priorities for the next um, three decades, which helped inform Plan Bay Area 2050. Yeah, like I mentioned, my interests, I'm really um, interested in making planning more accessible. Often within planning, you get a lot of the usual suspects coming in and opining on what their priorities are, but I'm really passionate about trying to open up doors and have feedback from a wider variety of residents. That's really important to me. And really, I think the last thing I'll just say in introducing myself is my other, another thing that I'm really passionate about is understanding how global climate change is worsening. Impacts are gonna impact people who have the fewest resources. So I really enjoy promoting sustainability and equity at the same time within my work. Thank you. I appreciate your, your introduction. It gives us a nice overview. And um, I, I appreciate having a sense of what motivates you. It's really helpful. So and now what I'd like you to do is talk about your career path, starting with maybe your undergraduate you know, training, education, and just moving through your career up till now, kind of um, speaking about the different um, landmarks along the way and any insights you'd like to share about you know, that you think would be helpful. Sure. And actually, I, I trace my journey and planning back even before my undergraduate uh, degree. I was really interested in urban planning before I even knew that there was a word for the term. I grew up in a pretty traditional suburban single family neighborhood, and I often experienced as I've felt that many people in, in this profession who have a similar background uh, have felt that it was very stifling, that lack of access whenever I was younger, especially, and I didn't have access to a car. Uh, so it was something I often was thinking about as I was walking around my neighborhood, uh, but I didn't realize that it was a career until I got into my undergrad and I saw uh, courses in the course catalog in urban planning. And really I was set 
ever since then on, on this was what I wanted to pursue. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree in public policy at the University of North Carolina. Um, I studied um, rural economic development while I was there. I also conducted research in Latin America on the transportation needs of people with disabilities, which was really informative to me. Um, then when I graduated, I knew I was interested in pursuing a career in planning, but I felt that I found that there were not very many opportunities uh, for people that didn't have a graduate degree. So I worked for a year at a community development nonprofit in Baltimore before applying to Berkeley's Master of City Planning program, where I studied transportation planning. Uh, and after I graduated in 2018 from the program, I got a, the job with MTC and ABAG. So I've been at MTC and ABAG for about a little bit more than two and a half years. Um, so I've, I've got a little bit of experience working in the nonprofit sector, uh, some minor experience working in research through the, the work that I did when I was enrolled in undergrad and grad school. And now I've got about two and a half years in the public sector. Thank you. So um, can you talk a little bit about what you've liked most, liked most along the way from the different uh, work that you've done? Yeah, so I, I really enjoy working in a public agency. For me, knowing that I'm working in the interests of the public is really important as opposed to working in a private uh, firm where there's a bit more of a conflict between working for the bottom line as well as obviously uh, working in support of your ideals. So I appreciate the fact that uh, ultimately I'm accountable to the public and to elected officials. Um, and I really enjoy as well working at the regional scale. Like I said, I'm a, a regional transportation planner. And I think the challenge of balancing the needs of these constituencies from people who live in urban places, suburban places, and even rural places, um, and trying to figure out the, the policies that really work best for everyone and the combination of policies is, is a challenge that I find really interesting and, and ever evolving. Thank you. So now I'd like to allow, you know, to open it up for you students to, um, you know, and if, if there are any of you who are alumni, to uh, jump in and ask any questions you might have. I can go. Also, sorry for joining 15 minutes late. Um, so sorry, I presumably missed you saying things. But um, so I'm a first year transportation concentration. Um, we just had, I should know her last name, Therese from MTC and ABAG come talk and like, this is the third or fourth time I've had somebody who's like very high up in that, um, in our regional planning organization come speak. And like, obviously they get this very, like a, a totally different scope than I'm sure what your experience has been um, since they've been there for a really long time. And I guess I'm just wondering like, what is it like working there? What's, if you can talk at all about like, what's the work culture of MTC? Is it like met your expectations? Yeah. That, that's a great question. Funnily enough, Therese is my boss's boss. So, <laughs> so you get a bit of a sense of the type of people who are working above me in the organization. I really appreciate your question too. On a on a day to day, just to give a sense of some of the tasks that are, are common for a planner working at a, a public agency in transportation, I do a lot of work um, with data analysis. So I work very closely with our modeling team who do simulation models to help us forecast the impacts of transportation projects and policies. And where I come in, since I don't have quite the same technical skill set that they do, is really in interpreting those results for policymakers and for members of the public. So a lot of writing about data, maybe doing some, some light data analysis. Uh, so definitely having that competency is key. But uh, where, where I think it's, it's really important is being able to talk about it and being able to talk about um, findings for multiple different audiences. So you may have a slightly different message or way of explaining things depending on who you're talking to. Um, I do a lot, a lot of public engagement work, public speaking, again, to those multiple audiences, uh, as well as preparing memos and presentations that are all, um, you know, made publicly available. So they go through a good bit of review uh, managing all of that review as well is, is part of the job. And then, um, you know, just formulating, formulating policy proposals for analysis. I work uh, on the long range plan. So we get to do a lot of ideation and a lot of dreaming big because the next 
three decades, which we're planning out to 2050, that's a lot of runway for examining some more transformational policies, like what would the impacts be on safety of reducing speed limits on freeways to 55 miles per hour? What would it be like if we had tolling on all lanes of the freeways in the Bay Area? So it, I really enjoy as well in long range planning, getting to think a bit more uh, broadly. The, the work culture at MTC, I really didn't know too much what to expect when I joined a government agency. I was definitely a little concerned about becoming a government drone, uh, <laughs> really getting embroiled in the bureaucracy. But I, I found um, from my experience and the experience of some of my classmates who also work in public sector jobs in the Bay Area, uh, that there's more flexibility than you think. There is still room to be creative within some of those bureaucratic bounds. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that uh, we, are we are supported in pushing some norms, trying to think a little bit uh, more broad. And, um, and it, I, just, I think that the work culture at MTC is really creative. Well, we work very hard. Uh, that is part of it um, too. But when, when you're motivated, um, you know, it can be rewarding. Um, so that, that's a little bit about my day to day. Other questions? Any questions about even just what, um, what skills are involved with transportation planning, say? Yeah. So I think that really, um, you know, there are a lot of different types of jobs within transportation planning. I've spoken of, I would say that my work airs a bit more on the side of the technical with the interpreting of modeled data and, and data visualization and communication. But uh, I don't wanna give the impression that you need to be a very technical person or have an interest in that to work in transportation planning. Um, some other skills that are, are really essential are, are writing and communication. I know I talk about that a lot because it, it is, is one of my uh, areas of, one of my passion areas, um, but also skills like um, developing policy, reading about best practices, seeing what other peer jurisdictions across the country and the globe are doing. Um, so some more of that policy, policy work is really important and also contributing to legislation or regulations. That's another area where um, having more of the, the strong writing skills and research skills is, is really key. Okay. Other questions from you guys? I can go again, or Julia. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Yes, um, I guess I would like to know, um, Raleigh, who are some of the partners or people that you get to work with, whether in like other departments at MTC or like within other agencies? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So MTC is around 250 employees, I think, and there are people working in short-term implementation, long-term planning, um, financing. So definitely within MTC, there's a lot of cross-sector collaboration. I work with financial analysts to help understand what the revenue picture is gonna be like when we think about what transportation projects we can fund over the next 30 years. But I think almost more of my work is interfacing externally. So uh, a key group of people that we work with are planning staff at counties and cities, but, but also there are a number of advocacy organizations or non-governmental organizations that have deep developed relationships with MTC and ABAG and they will sit on advisory boards for us. They, um, you know, they engage with us and we meet with them and um, it helps maybe push us to think about some of our um, tried and true patterns in a little bit of a different way. And the last thing I'll say, something that uh, has really been an emphasis over the past two and a half years, the time that I, uh, whenever I, I joined MTC, was trying to do more to strengthen partnerships with community-based organizations. Uh, that's really important um, for reasons that I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, helping to cultivate these multi-year relationships with community-based organizations where staff are compensated for their time. Uh, it's also really key. Uh, that's another part of our long-range planning work. So for Plan Bay Area 2050, I think we have a, a group of 
uh, around 10 community-based organizations covering a, a variety of different uh, interest areas. So there's one group that um, advocates for people with disabilities. There's one group that is involved with youth engagement, um, one that's really focused on affordable housing production. So representing a broad spectrum of, of the interests. Um, but their involvement is, is also really important as we try to help um, advance equity through the plan. Olivia, did you wanna ask your question? Yeah, um, I guess thinking back to many moons ago when you were a student, like beyond, I guess the core transportation curriculum with the MCP program, are there things like you regretted not taking at the time or like skills you've picked up since then that like you could have learned in a classroom? Um, mm. <laughs> That's a really great question. So I think I have one answer, which is probably not that interesting. And I think this has changed actually for you all, but for my methods courses, we learned statistical programming in Stata, which was this expensive subscription-based program. I think I heard you all are using open source software now, which is fab because I did not have access to that once I graduated. Um, so I had to reteach myself how to do all those same things in R. Um, which is which was fine, but I, that's one of the challenges that I also would would highlight is finding time to develop your skills once you enter the job job market. It's definitely a bit tougher. So I, I do really um, that was one of my takeaways from from my time in grad school was that it was really important to develop the technical skills that you want to apply in practice uh, while you're in grad school because you may not have as much flexibility to skill up later. Um, there is some, and I think it varies by organization, but when, when you're really busy, it's easy for that to fall to the, um, to the bottom of the to-do list. Uh, but things I regretted or, or learned in grad school, um, I, think that, I think my biggest regret was not taking more advantage of all the um, speakers that come to Berkeley. I, <laughs> like me, oh no, um, I, I, I think that just the the opportunities and the exposure that that you get is is really incredible, and and the networking opportunities and just hearing more. Um, that's what I miss the most now that I'm out. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about it's a question that comes from students who really stress about their experience after they graduate from their undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned your nonprofit experience. How did that shape your professional development and what skills helped you for grad school and where you are now? That's a, that's a good question. I think working in a nonprofit, I definitely learned a lot about flexibility because it's a, it's a tight staff. So you may be doing one task one day and a very different task another day just to keep everything rolling. So just from a, a work culture perspective, I really learned to value uh, and develop my flexibility and my ability to wear multiple hats. Um, and working in a, a community development nonprofit in particular, for me, it, um, the, the nonprofit focused on pairing community groups with ar architects, planners, landscape architects who would uh, basically create these professional level designs for community groups, helping to translate the, the group's ideas into a professional level design document that they might not have had the, uh, the money to produce otherwise. And then they were able to you know, implement that or take it to funders, uh, but really just right out of undergrad, getting immersed in this community-led um, atmosphere for me was really impactful uh, just in, in instilling in me from, from an early, early point in my career how important it is to um, you know, implement things in a grassroots way and to not try to impose any sort of a top-down um, planning process. Can you say more about your internship experiences and your, your research and maybe a little bit of your teaching? Just yeah. the different kinds of experiences. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so uh, in between my first year and my second year, I interned with SFMTA, which I don't know if any of you all are considering that or have done that. I had a really positive experience working at SFMTA. Their intern program famously does a lot for professional development, which I found very valuable, getting to learn a little bit about a lot of different things that are going on at MTA. I worked um, on the Geary Rapid Project, helping to summarize some 
uh, community input and, and make maps. So that was my summer internship project. And then otherwise, I had a few different appointments while I was um, at, during my, doing my MCP. I did a little bit of map making for a project that studied the relationship between bus rapid transit and um, privatized microtransit in several countries in the global south. I was a GSI for YPlan, which is a, an undergraduate class that um, is a service learning class. And the undergrads work with high school students while the high, high school students are doing a planning project. I, I really enjoyed that because it was very different than anything I had ever done. Um, and the work that the high school students produced was really amazing, really incredible. And I think that youth engagement is something that we can improve a lot on um, as planners actually. And then I was the GSI for uh, CP201B, the re second research methods class, which I also really enjoyed because I enjoy working with data and I really liked getting to know all the first year students in a more uh, personal way. I thought that was a really fun uh, thing to be involved in. And I was a GSR at um, CCI, Center for Community Innovation with Karen Chapel studying the uh, relationship between bicycle infrastructure and business performance. So I, I got a, I got a lot of experience in a lot of different um, places trying to patch together the tuition remission. Um, but I feel like that was one of also one of the highlights of my time at Berkeley was getting to work with those professors and um, learn more. Can you can you say something about how you approached finding those opportunities? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, um, with a lot of effort, because the, the rewards are very high, um, I, I definitely reached out to professors and, and demonstrated my interest before the applications even opened. I think that just getting your name on their minds is really um, helpful. And I, um, I also cast a wide net. So I applied for GSI positions in many different departments, not only in city planning, that was really important. And um, I, yeah, I just kind of kept my ear to the ground asking other people, what were they working on? Did they think that there might be any more positions? Um, and, and really, yeah, just putting in the, the time um, and, and casting a wide net. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about your the application process of for the MTA and then the MTC? That's a really good idea because actually, even though they're two government agencies, the application processes were a bit different. So MTA, like a lot of government agencies, applied a, a pretty programmatic approach to the application. There was a very formalized interview that was part of it, where every applicant received the same questions and and everything was um, sort of very rigid uh, around that interview. I've also heard for some of the permanent positions at MTA, you'll need to take a placement test for to qualify to get on a list for certain planner classifications. MTC doesn't have, and I think that's because um, MTA is a city agency while MTC is, is a regional agency. So the, the two organizations have different requirements because they're they're in different jurisdictions. MTC had a bit more of a flexible uh, application process. I submitted my resume, cover letter, and a questionnaire. I think there were two or three one to two page um, questions where I needed to respond. And then I had a panel interview with three people who were one who would become my supervisor, one who was his supervisor, and then a third person as well for as well as an outside a planner from a peer organization which I wasn't expecting actually, but uh, it was interesting to have her presence in the room as well. Um, from start to finish, I saw the job probably in mid-February and I received my offer probably mid-April. So two months, I know that the process can be much, much longer depending on the agency, uh, especially if they're employing a list, um, a, the list approach, then it can take a, months to a year. Could you say something about the list approach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can take um, it can take a long time, months to a year, for a position to open up where you would be would be offered. So, 
you would apply just to say, I want to be a, a planner too, because I meet these criteria for city of San Francisco, and you might be selected for a number of different departments and offered a job. Um, but since you're just on a list, it's a bit un unclear on when, if ever, you would be called. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> How did you handle the um, uncertainty? I um, hmm. I I tried to not put too much pressure on myself to um, to have a job on day one post graduation. I think one thing I saw some of my classmates doing, which I'll talk about, is uh, sometimes there can be a way to line up a GSR position that goes through the summer. And that gave them a bit more uh, flexibility to be earning some money while they were applying for a, a full-time gig. So that was kind of a nice runway where you're still employed, you're still earning some money, um, but you there's an understanding from all parties that it's not permanent and you're able to freely look for another job. Um, but it, it, it's tough, but you, uh, you know, for all of you Berkeley students, you have a really strong credential and, and you, you just have to have some confidence and faith. Thank you. Any other questions from students? Hi, um, my name is Nayeli. I'm a second year undergraduate student. And I was just wondering, um, prior to applying for your master's and, and entering the job course in general, I was wondering if there's any like technical skills that you would recommend or any courses that you might recommend that we take prior to that. Because I know um, GIS is something that's often talked about when it comes to city planning. And I was wondering like, um, I know you touched upon this before, but yeah, I was wondering if like there's anything that you'd recommend. Um. I think a good approach, uh, a good approach whenever you are thinking about the courses that you want to take is to think a little bit about when you're applying, how do you want to cast yourself, right? Do you want to cast yourself as a technician? If so, you would want to really develop your skills in statistical programming like Python or R or GIS. Uh, maybe you consider yourself more of a policy person. So you would want to skill up in different places, right? You would wanna really show your critical writing and reading skills. Um, you might wanna to try to get some writing published like a letter to an editor or some, some research. So I think there's no one recipe for success, uh, but I guess I will say if you are interested in entering a master's program in city planning, there are a few skill sets that you, you will probably need to have some familiarity with. That's working with data in Excel in particular, just kind of having an, a familiarity even with working with data in a data table, um, GIS and writing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, we do know what your long-term career goals are. <laughs> Not that you should. <laughs> That's a good question. You know, I um, right now I'm really happy at MTC. I'm really happy working at this again at the regional scale. I talked about that earlier. How I think that is a really um, interesting challenge. I I'm not from the Bay Area, but I really enjoy living in the Bay Area. Uh, but I'm I'm also not married to it, so I think. You know, I am really interested in, in finding work where um, I can see the work that I'm contributing to being turned into action. I feel like that's really vague. Um, so I'm happy for now, but I'm, I'm open to, <laughs> to, um, to, you know, just finding, finding what, whatever keeps me interested and engaged. I don't have a, a well one vision. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people have a very clear plan and some other times it's a matter of, okay, we'll see what presents itself. But that sounds like you're really, you know, in a good, you're in a flow right now. So you don't feel like, oh, I better go looking. I gotta, you know, yeah. find something else. So, I mean, that's, it's nice that you're getting to be there. Um, can you, is there anybody along the way who has influenced you a lot? Hmm, hmm. that's a good question. I think for me, I found I often find inspiration in my peers and in my colleagues. Um, I 
yeah, every day I get, I really enjoy my work because I go to work with people who are really passionate and talented. And I felt that way when I was an undergrad and I felt that way when I was working at the nonprofit. Um, but just really seeing uh, the day-to-day work it's it that goes on that my colleagues do to keep things moving forward it's really it's inspirational even when it's a slog um and i just get i get really inspired by um how how dedicated everyone is but yeah no no one um sort of figure or anything like that sure. okay yeah, yeah. Hmm. okay what kinds of interests do you students have? In, in other words, um, as Heidi was asking earlier, um, what directions are you thinking about, or you know, how can Raleigh, you know, give you some um, perspectives that might be helpful for your direction? Julia's ready to talk yet. I mean, this is, isn't this something that we grapple with every day? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think I've, uh, I worked at a few nonprofits before coming to Cal for this program. Um, and like, despite the program's like unintentional regional focus at time, like feel that I definitely want to work at the local level, but like, I guess I haven't met anybody from the short term implementation part of MTC yet. So maybe maybe there's yet hope that I could find myself at an MPO one day if I wanted to. So yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I feel one of the more rewarding things at working at the local level is oftentimes you do get to see the things that you're working on implemented. I, I do a lot of thinking about what would the impacts of a, a new Transbay rail crossing do, uh, which would optimistically probably open in 2040, 2050. <laughs> so I, I definitely see that as a, a benefit of working in local government. And it's more flexible. I feel like it's a bit more all hands on deck um, because it's so focused on the operations. And I, I like that aspect of it. Probably, I'm curious if um, either, you know, with your time at the nonprofit or at um, SFMTA or MTC, like, did you feel, like, how equipped did you feel on day one to kind of, like, plug in and start doing the work? And then also, like, what were some of the things that you learned on the job that were, like, not related to anything that you did in school? That is such a good question. That's a great question. Um, I felt, thinking back to day one, I did, I, I felt, I felt um, like I was ready. I think the thing that I felt very confident, the things I felt very confident in were my technical skills. Um, like I mentioned as well, since people who have been there for a while don't have as much time to keep their skills sharp, I was able to do some shiny things that other, um, other staff weren't able to do, which was helpful for me to, to demonstrate my value on the team early on. But I think the part that really, I don't know if it's possible to learn in school uh, is navigating some of the politics and learning how to speak from your agency or organization's point of view. I think that's really, it's, it's dependent and it's learned with time. Um, and it's something I'm still developing, you know, what's the right tone on this issue? What's the stance? How do, how do we talk about this? How do we move our agenda forward without naming it? Um, so I think that's a skill that is really can only be built by doing. Are there any myths or misconceptions about transportation planning that you um, either that you had and then that were you know demystified or or you know you found oh wait that's not true or that you hear from other people? Yes, I I was thinking a bit about this. Um, I think one myth that I had leaving grad school was that there was a, a rivalry or, or we were at odds transportation planners and transportation engineers. 
Um, I don't know if you all have felt that way, <laughs> um, but I actually have met a lot of very cool transportation engineers in my time. So I think that while sometimes we're encouraged to think about problems differently, like for example, a stereotypical engineer would really care about maximizing the number of vehicles that are moving through a, a road. I think that there are a lot broader perspectives within transportation engineering. Um, and I really value working with people who have those skill sets who are actually thinking about how to promote safety, how to promote multimodal use on corridors. Um, and so that was something that was dispelled for me a bit, I will admit. Thank you. Is there anything you'd want to say about your lifestyle? I mean, you know, how working at the MTC, um, you know, how does that impact your lifestyle? And and maybe you might maybe you could say something about COVID and the impact on, you know, what the experience was like has been like. Yeah. So let's see. Um, I'll start with the second question about how COVID has impacted our work. I mentioned that one of the primary projects I work on is the long range plan. And it's when we've been doing engagement, it's been really difficult to, um, to try to get people to think past the current moment when their needs are so great. And that's completely understandable. We're, we're only human and um, it's a hierarchy of needs. So I completely understand. But that's been a real challenge for us is trying to make people feel um, heard, like their concerns are being heard and are valid, um, but also we're not necessarily able to act on what they're expressing now. So trying to help sort of thread that through line between the pain points that they're experiencing now and how those might carry forward into the long term. Uh, that's been a really interesting challenge that I think we're definitely still still mastering um, when it comes to integrating COVID within our work. And the lifestyle, um, while well, MTC has a really beautiful building, which I haven't been to in the past year, that's definitely something I really enjoy. It's in San Francisco and it's a, a new full of light building. So that's really lovely. It is in a place where there is, uh, there are basically no lunch options, which is a downside. Um, <laughs> but I've been, been working from home for, for the past year now, uh, almost. And overall, um, you know, the experience working at MTC has been really positive. There are a number of UC Berkeley alums from the planning program over the years there, which is a, kind of a nice thing to bond over, but it of course isn't exclusively um, M, uh, MCP alums. And um, yeah, that's all I can think on that. Thanks. How much, how much diversity is there among the staff that's a good question. Um, that's something that our agency recognizes as an area that we need to improve. Um, you know, transportation has historically been a very white career, a very male career. Um, so that is is something that we we know that we need to improve on. I think that's something where, personally, I would like to see our internship program become a bit more developed. We may not have the resources that MTA does to, to put toward a large intern program. But I think that, you know, thinking through all levels of the pipeline is something that is really important. You know, how can we partner with HBCUs to get more interns in at the door? Uh, this isn't part of my job. It's just something that I think about um, on the side, but um, it's, it, it is a, a big problem when the people that are doing the planning are not reflective of the population that they serve. So there, it's, it's definitely something that I think the entire industry can improve on. Hmm. <clears throat> Do you think that impacts um, the agency's ability to work with communities of color? I think that's interesting. I think that that's where those partnerships with the community-based organizations have been really important is trying to um, sort of find the gatekeepers um, and, and develop those partnerships um, so that we are able to get repeat interactions with people and deep dives. Um, that That's definitely been key. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Trying 
trying to think if there's anything else that I would, would share with you all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you're from North Carolina, right? Yes. And um, is there anything you'd want to say about the, the, how, how transportation is different there from you know, here? Because you were talking as a kid, you know, being aware of transportation. I'm just wondering how your experience, you know, being in the suburbs, whatever, in, influenced mm-hmm. your, your decision. Well, definitely, definitely in the Bay Area, um, housing development is a lot more political than anything I ever experienced growing up. Um, obviously, there's a lot of exclusionary practices when it comes to jurisdictions trying to discourage more housing from being developed uh, within their boundaries. Um, and it's really, it's, it, it really makes people very passionate on both sides of the issue. Uh, but the, the nimbyism that I've experienced in California is, and often nimbyism under the guise of environmentalism is something that is <laughs> unlike anything that I had experienced before. It's, def- it's definitely a challenge. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's such a wealth disparity among the, you know, people who the have and have nots, if you will, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're mentioning, you know, so under the guise of environmentalism, are there other kinds of sectors that you interface with, or I'm just trying to get a feeling for, um, it could be the political context or just um, other fields that kind of intersect with Mm -hmm. yours? That's great, a good question. Definitely housing, like I was mentioning, um, you know, everybody who, uh, who studies planning at Berkeley will know that housing and transportation planning are, um, they must be linked. Uh, So a good bit of uh, working with people who are planning for housing within the planning team at MTC and also not me personally, but my colleagues often will do a lot of work working with local jurisdictions as they update their housing elements to to um, plan out where new housing is going to be developed in the short term. So that's definitely um, one key linkage. And then I think a bit more I've seen because of things with COVID-19, but a bit more of an interface between um, people who are interested in parks and open space and promoting accessibility to those places. Uh, We're seeing those stakeholders becoming um, more vocal. And I think that's really great, obviously, uh, with the need for everybody has to get a little fresh air or to maybe socialize in an open space, um, improving accessibility to those amazing open spaces that we have here in the Bay Area. Um, that's also been sort of a, a linkage I've seen becoming stronger. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We have a little more time if anybody out there has any more questions. This isn't a question, but I did just check my email and SFMTA did send out like a little survey like, oh yeah, Julia got yours too, good. <laughs> so so. <laughs> Maybe maybe that happened. Maybe we made the first cut because of being here right now, and you you <laughs> spawned it, Riley. So thank you. Congratulations. That's that's <laughs> exciting. Yeah, I can't speak highly enough of that program. I think it's very it's really wonderful. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and you you've talked a little bit about environmentalism. I mean, or your your concern with climate change, and um, are there ways that you think you want to get more involved with that? I think just really figuring out ways within transportation planning to be more explicit uh, about how scary it is if we don't change our behaviors. Um, um, yeah, you know, it's, I think that we understand what we need to do and it, now it's just about getting people out of cars, getting more housing in places near opportunity and near transit. Um, and I think, you know, we, we know the tools, we just need to get the political will to apply them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where, where do you think um, the uh, blocks are? I mean, like, um, cause you're saying the political will, like um, what are the, the um, obstacles that need to be overcome or, you know, mm, yeah. the levers that need to be. Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> 
But yes, that, that's a good question. I think we all already talked a little bit about how housing development can be very political and, and opposing or promoting housing can be very political. But, um, you know, some of the, the levers that we'll need to pull to get people to change their transportation behavior are not that politically popular. So increasing the cost to drive Mm -hmm. or making it less convenient because streets are more multimodal or there are fewer lanes of traffic available for cars because we're converting more lanes to serve buses or serve bikes. Um, yeah, there's parking is parking mm -hmm. is personal, apparently. There's a lot of <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of hard feelings about that. Yeah. Parking. Right. Yeah. Thanks for pointing those things out. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So um you know, we don't have to go all the way to the end. Um, if you know, but if, if you have, you know, a few more minutes, if you have any dying questions or even, you know, inklings of of curiosity, you, you have the opportunity to ask or to comment. I guess one last question I would have, um, and you know, you could speak to your own experience or maybe like other experiences of like your your colleagues coming out of the MCP program. But um, you know, I think we're all kind of aware of the like the same resources or communication channels for finding out about jobs and internships. But like, what are some other things that we should be keeping keeping an ear out for, or like where should we be looking for like other opportunities besides you know like all the all the local agencies or local firms that we're all applying to <laughs> I, re I remember some of that from my own time um i think i think there can be value in trying to make connections with people who work at agencies where you would be interested in working i remember that um my boss was one of the reviewers in my transportation studio and I kind of made sure that I was the one that was going to send the thank you because I was interested in working at MTC. Um, so, you know, got my name at least maybe into his subconscious. Um, so I, I think that really trying to make, make the personal connections where you can is, is a good, um, a good place to look. And then otherwise I don't have any, any particular tips. I think that a lot of places will have uh, like job interest forms where you can say, I'm interested in he receiving notifications. Just so making sure that, that you're uh, receiving those notifications can help you get the first, um, first sort of look. I would like to second the whole thing about networking or just making connections because you never know where something might lead. And the more you put yourself out there and it's kind of putting it out in the universe it's, and believing in some, you know, somehow that things will happen, putting your energy out, you're more likely to have things come back to you. Um, just the more people you connect with and make positive impressions on, the more it just seems that things work, that things tend to happen more in your favor than if you're just applying and keeping, you know, yourself less visible. So using LinkedIn, you know, the alumni portal on LinkedIn, using Worcester Life, um, talking with professors and asking them who do they know wherever, you know, wherever you're interested in. Um, I think, yeah. And not being shy about sending a, a connection request on LinkedIn, because I notice a lot of my network will post jobs on LinkedIn, just like on their personal account. Mm -hmm. I never think it's odd when someone asks to connect. Yeah. And if, you know, if you're feeling like, I don't know how to do that, or I'm nervous, about, or what do I say, you can set up an appointment with me. I'm happy to talk with you about it. You know, um, I help people with all aspects of, you know, the career development process from figuring out what you want to do to um, resume, cover letter, interviewing, just um, job search, internship search, that whole thing. So even though I'm not in the field, there are processes that are, you know, that any career counselor would, would want to encourage you to engage in. Okay. So I think we're, I think we're um, out of time unless there are any last minute, like, yes, wait, I have one more thing. 